So, ladies and gentlemen, he gave the graduation address at UNC. That's who's next. Professor Ramesh Rasker, uh, he was one of the fastest in the history of MIT to get tenure. He was in industry, he had a bunch of uh, patents, he invented the Pico projector. When he came here, he did research to see around corners. He worked at, uh, at Google X. He, for two years, he worked at Apple to help them with their uh, security strategy roadmap. Uh, he worked at Microsoft, and he worked at Facebook, helping them with their health stuff. Uh, the big companies asked him to come in and be the X factor, be the, the creative innovator. Uh, but I think his biggest legacy is uh, his teams that he's attracted here and what they've gone on to do. I think one company was just bought by Alphabet, and he's just crushing it. Uh, and he's just getting started, and he really believes in the potential of, of uh, what's in front of us. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Ramesh Rasker. Thank you, John, and also I'm a professor here at the MIT Media Lab, so welcome to MIT Media Lab. All right, uh, hello everyone. So let's talk about Web3 and decentralized AI, or DEC AI. Now, my cousin Amy, who's in her 50s, is diabetic, has a family history of lung cancer, recently she had chest x-rays, and started complaining about chest pain and she's just not happy with the treatment she's getting in her rural hospital. And I wondered, you know, can I just bet, can I just bid $1,000 on Web3 so that somehow, you know, the global hive can actually give me a solution of what's the best treatment for, for Amy? So I think we have an opportunity to take Web3 from a payment economy to serve the siloed data and AI economy. Now, if I were to do this for Amy today, you know, the answer is somewhere out there. The solution is in some hospital, there's some collective intelligence that can actually already solve this problem. We don't have to invent a whole new drug. So the way it would be done is there'll be research grants written, you know, people will aggregate all the data from multiple hospitals, they'll try to find patterns, they'll train some models, they'll publish them. At some point, it'll become a protocol, and eventually, Amy will get the guidance. Very slow, inefficient coordination that's required. To, to make it happen. Now, if magically, if I had a God's eye view, I would just tell all the hospitals in the world to just give me the data. I will train the best machine learning algorithms. I would even take my $1,000 and you know, correspondingly uh, uh, distribute them to the people who are helping me, uh, and then bring back the suggestions to Amy. Right? And we tout Web3 as a platform for decentralization. Can Web3 solve this problem? I mean, come on. I mean, all of us care about our loved ones, and we're using the power of Web3 to solve a narrow sliver of societal problems, but I think all of us deserve to have much better solutions. Now, the reality of the God's Eye view is that the hospitals are unwilling to share their data because of you know, regulations or trade secrets or privacy. You know, uh, even if you can get all these petabytes of data, we don't know how to train the models. Uh, you know, how do we do this remotely? How do we choose the best one? Uh, and if you want to re reward the corresponding hospitals who actually eventually help you, you know, how do you figure out how to split those $1,000 that I have? Um, and things are, things are happening in a very invisible manner. And even if, can, if I can bring the information back to, back to Amy, it's not going to look like Expedia or something where I can just show all the options uh, that she can choose, choose between. So, Clearly, we have to augment the Web3 nodes in an interesting way beyond mining and verification and validation and storage and so on. And we have to think about other nodes we may have to add to Web3 that includes AI services, hospitals, health exchange platforms, and of course, the consumers. Now, you have seen those slides for Web1 and Web2 is read and write and Web3 is about own. But I would like you to think about this progression in a slightly different way. I would say that we have done a very good job of exploiting the data to connect you know, different uh, disjointed points over time. But we haven't done as good a job in actually extracting understanding and intelligence from these trends. And only now, as we start thinking about cooperation, we need to start worrying about what does it mean to infer, what does it mean to understand, what does it mean to actually extract you know, that extra bit of intelligence, the collective intelligence that's out there. So I think the intersection of Web3 and decentralized AI is really poised 
to allow us to do this self-orchestration in a very decentralized manner. So we have the same problems here, if you have to help Amy. Aggregate data, mine the data, reward the participants, and guide Amy. Now, many components of Web3 already exist, you know, through pseudo anonymity for aggregation, ledger tech that allows us to uh, orchestrate, uh, incentive and game theory that encourages others to participate and still get you know, fair compensation, uh, and there are exchanges like Coinbase and, and, and FTX and others you know, that guide us uh, of how to, uh, for decision support. I'm going to talk about four corresponding technologies that we must introduce to take Web3 into the world of decentralized AI. And right here at MIT, MIT Media Lab, there's research going on in all these directions. So I encourage you to go to our website about many, many papers that are being written up, you know, many think tanks that are discussing these ideas, uh, and hopefully after the session, uh, we can do a deep dive as well. So let me go through these four augmentations one by one. The first one is privacy tech. Instead of the pseudo-anonymity that's possible today uh, in Web3, we want true no-peak privacy. And what is that? I mean, if you think about Google Maps, we willingly give away our GPS locations without a sense of privacy, and we get great utility out of it because Google can deliver traffic density and turn water navigation for that. On the other hand, when it comes to health data, uh, it gets siloed uh, because of regulations and privacy constraints, and we're simply not able to recover the best treatments uh, for Amy. So this is very frustrating, right? So the kind of new algorithms that are emerging in distributed and private uh, AI uh, are the ones that really matter. Uh, so a lot of work here we do at, at the MIT Media Lab uh, is called split learning, splitlearning.mit.edu, that's trying to solve this problem. So let me give you a flavor of how this works, right? Now, when you think about privacy, the bottom left, the, the yellow circle, is how we think about privacy. A little bit of data about each of us, and are we able to protect that uh, in a certain way? But in reality, privacy also plays a role at organizational level and even you know, at nation scale. Uh, and when we think about organizational level, privacy could mean because of regulation or because of trade secrets, you cannot share that data. You know, those chest x-rays we talked about for Amy, the reason some nations may not want to give it is because they're doing particular kind of research or they're worried about you know, other nations figuring out you know, how particular individuals in that country are suffering from particular, certain kinds of disease. Or organizations like pharma companies or insurance players you know, might be worried about that there is, a, uh, there is a, a data breach or there could be a, a rogue employee uh, who could be leaking this data. So for many reasons, data cannot be shared and it remains siloed. And of course, at nation scale, you know, the Chinese and the Koreans couldn't share with us the chest x-rays at the beginning of COVID, because for them it was also a national security issue. Although it would have been nice to create a machine learning algorithm that looks, looks, looks at a chest X-ray and can quickly figure out what kind of COVID symptoms this patient is going to have very soon. So that's kind of how we should think about privacy, not just individual privacy, but at organizational and, and nation scale. What about the relationship with confidentiality and anonymity? Now, confidentiality means we're just protecting the identity but we are not protecting the data, right? Um, so that's not good enough, that's not privacy. Then you can upgrade that to pseudo-anonymity, which we see on Web3, but unfortunately you'll have a persistent identifier and using overlapping data sets, you can recover that. You can do slightly better by using non-persistent identifiers, which is anonymity that you would see in a lot of Apple products, uh, but that's also not enough because you still have other overlapping activities that allows you to create a fingerprint um, and, and create, at least create cohorts. The kind of privacy we're talking about here that we need for Web3 and decentralized AI is a privacy I would call no peak. Uh, so please take a look. There's a, there's a lot of documentation online about what no peak privacy uh, could look like. So again, we are not talking about just protecting identity, but we're also talking about protecting data. That means those chest x-rays that the hospitals have to provide, they never should have to share them. And if they share them in some particular form, nobody should, nobody should be able to reconstruct those chest x-rays given by those hospitals. So there are four common ways people have thought about adding privacy. As I said, anonymization is no privacy at all. Um, there are techniques like differential privacy that would add some noise uh, to the data. Um, uh, and then probably the best kind of privacy is by using encryption, techniques like homomorphic encryption. The challenge with these methods is that if you look at the other axis, which is the utility, 
of this data is that most of these methods end up reducing the way you can exploit this data, for example, the chest x-rays and the treatment plans, to create meaningful machine learning models. So two techniques have emerged over the last five years. One is called federated learning, invented by Google, uh, and the other one is called split learning, invented by our group here at MIT. And these kind of techniques I'm really excited about because they allow you to take data for decentralized operations, like decentralized AI. And the key idea behind these techniques is that you just want to share wisdom without sharing the raw data. So instead of sharing the chest x-rays and treatment plans, you can just create the wisdom of what a solution for Amy could look like. The second challenge is how can we upgrade the ledger tech? Um, not just for verifying transactions, but creating verifiable, decentralized AI. So uh, nodes can do hashing, but their task is going to be shift to training. Um, and their proof of work now shifts to verifying the AI task itself, which is giving some providence on what type of data was used, which x-rays were used, what treatment plans were used, did you use the right kind of data with right kind of diversity, and did you have the, the, in the right kind of test accuracy. All of this has to be done without looking at the raw data, without calling up the hospital or demanding to see the raw data. Uh, for consensus, the nodes had to figure out, you know, how do we figure the best algorithm that's emerging either from a given hospital or by a consortium of hospitals to help Amy. And then finally, instead of publishing, we'll have to figure out how we package this data, this data so that it's not just verifiable on a blockchain, but it's also interpretable when Amy has to figure out which treatment is best for her. The third challenge is the, the incentives. Now, blockchain and Web3 have completely revolutionized how we can solve the cold start problem. How can we use tokenization, uh, to get many players to participate in a system and how we can fairly compensate them. Now we have to go well beyond that because not just about transactions, but we're talking about a lot of personal data, treatment plans, chest x-rays, you know, health records, uh, and so on. So the, the problem in a lot of these cases is to create a new form of a market, which I would like to call either a data market or a model market. Uh, in this case, the buyer might have some existing data. I might have the treatment plans and chest x-rays for Amy and a few other people. And I would like to go, other, go outside and query you know, hundreds of hospitals out there saying, I want to find out from you if you have relevant data for me. But I have to perform that operation without exchanging raw data. The one way to solve the problem is to do a mathematical operation, which is called correlation. And if the correlation is very high, then I know without looking at the raw data, that this may be actually very, very relevant for me, and also not redundant. So it's always a trade-off between data that's relevant, but not redundant. Uh, and from that, I had to create you know, a new valuation function that says if thousands of hospitals participated and they responded to my query, how would I take my $1,000 and distribute amongst them? Those are completely new forms of algorithm. So the key challenge here is how can we estimate the dollar value of the data that you cannot see? And then finally, when all these queries and responses come back, you know, much like on Coinbase or, or FTX, you know, you, those platforms allow you to deal with problems such as you know, discovery, visualization, and decision support, uh, you need a way for Amy and me and you know, all of us who are trying to help our loved ones to take that data uh, and be able to figure out whether it's interpretable, uh, run some what-if scenarios, and at the same time figure out if they fit with particular parameters that could be aggressive treatment, or not aggressive treatment, you have to travel for it or not. So all these solutions have to be packaged in a way that they are actually interpretable. Now there are many risks. I mean, we just know about you know, the risks of believing in algorithmic social orchestration, like the one I'm talking about. Those of you, you know, who made a lot of money on Luna and USD will know that. Um, now, bad actors in this case are invisible because their data is invisible to us. The only thing we know is the wisdom that was extracted from their data. So the bad actors can actually introduce a lot of adversarial data. Uh, so that's the challenge. I mean, they might do it because they want to just resell you know, useless data, or they might want to actually create harm. And as I said earlier, the trade-off between the data that you want is very relevant, at the same time not redundant, uh, is a big question. Now, it's obvious to all of us that 
this type of societal orchestration where the data is invisible and we need a God's eye view to solve it is not limited to just you know, health queries. Uh, whether it's you know, dealing with transportation, supply chain, you know, civic planning. Imagine if systems can tap into our smartphones and extract our GPS trail in a completely privacy preserving way, computational privacy, not just design, uh, and use that for solving societal problems such as civic planning or taxation issues uh, or even thinking about different types of climate change uh, policies. And imagine for supply chain, if suppliers and, and consumers can allow us to run what if scenarios by again allowing us to tap into their ledgers. So all these things are possible if we can build the building blocks required to take Web3 in the world of decentralized AI. And if you have to create this God's eye view to really help you know, our loved ones uh, for their health, I think the talent is in this room. So let's do it together. Thank you.